Thank you. Thank you for coming here. I'm delighted to see you in such large numbers. Uh, I want to thank um, Anthony, Dr. Anthony McCarthy for inviting me here. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure, as I say, to be here. The only um, regret I have about being here is that, sadly, I'm missing the March for Life, which is taking place today in Dublin, beginning at 2 o'clock. Um, last year we got 70,000 people at it. We're expecting that it will be bigger this year. If you want to follow it on um, uh, uh, on your uh, on Twitter and the hashtag, the, 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 you can follow it on um, hashtag um, Save the Eighth. Um, I'm going to um, talk first of all. I'm going to. Sp I'm a clinician as well as a, 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 an academic, so I actually see real life patients in my in my clinics. Um, they're not just numbers, although the numbers are hugely important and I have no difficulty dealing with numbers either. But, but, but patients and what they tell you and what their families tell you say a lot and they sort of ground you and give, give meaning to the figures and um, uh, the figures can inform your clinical practice but your clinical practice can give you a take on the figures and the data and what it all means. Um, there are two aspects to my talk this morning. The first part will deal briefly with the current situation in Ireland and how we got to where we are. And the second part will deal briefly with the issue of abortion either helping or harming women's mental health. Harm I'm not going to speak very much about because I know Professor Pr Priscilla Coleman will be speaking about that this, this afternoon. So I'll speak mainly about uh, does the question of whether abortion helps women's health. There are important dates um, in relation to Ireland um, and its abortion laws. Prior to 1982, um, there was there was no uh, the, the, well the 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 uh, protect the the um, ordinary common laws that existed protected um, the life of the unborn child. But in 1982. Um, uh, a referendum was held to amend Article 43 to allow for the equal right to life of the mother and the unborn baby, and that was put into the Constitution. The reason being it was feared that any protections that had previously been accorded would be wiped away by the enactment of pro-choice laws, pro-abortion laws, similar to the ones you, that, 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 that existed here. And there was, at the, that time, the beginning, there, there, were, there were mumbling, mumblings that maybe um, abortion should be allowed in certain circumstances, uh, particularly uh, in the Labour Party in Ireland and in some, some of the members of the Fine Gael Party who are currently the, in government. And so um, the campaign got off the ground, and it was it, the law was uh, the, the referendum was passed by um, a two-to-one majority, and the law and, and the, the, the it was an, it was incorporated into the constitution, and um, no law b covered that. It, it wasn't backed up by any law. And then in 1992, a situation arose where a young woman called Miss X, she was 14. And she was admitted to um, the to a maternity hospital in Dublin. Um, she was pregnant, and she was she was admitted because because of the pregnancy and because I don't know if she was uh, if she had a threatened miscarriage or if, if there was some other reason for her admission. But her parents at that point were planning on taking her bringing her to England for an abortion. And they applied to the Attorney General to know if the information uh, from the, uh, the, the, the baby that would have been aborted, if DNA information would be used to prosecute the man who had raped this, this young woman. It was a statutory rape. She was babysitting his children, <clears throat> and he had intercourse with her, and she was under the age, so, um, so it was statutory rape. And the Attorney General, because of the... R 43 3 of the Constitution banned her from travelling to England for an abortion. Um, uh, the, the country took to the, uh, the whole country took to the streets and demonstrated against the Attorney General and um, people then who felt we needed laws to allow for abor abortion in certain circumstances were emboldened and became more active in promoting that. Um, 
various attempts were made to and, and sorry the the attorney general banned the um the, her traveling it was appealed to the supreme court and the supreme court in ireland in um 1991 said um that she um should have been allowed to um to go to the uk for an abortion because she was suicidal so her suicidality, the threat to her life posed by suicide risk was the ground on which the Supreme Court reached its decision in, um, in, 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 in tandem with the threat to life and the risk to, the life, to her life that was posed by, the, um, by her threats. Of course, when the um, country voted, um, mental health risks and suicide risks weren't included. It was, it was assumed it was physical risks <clears throat> um, and indeed, since, since then, um, the physical risk has always been dealt with by, where possible, trying to preserve the life of the baby if a baby has to be delivered early. Um, so people have not died because of Article 43.3. But this, this threw a whole new dimension to it. It opened up the mental health dimension and the suicide dimension. The young woman wasn't actually seen by a psychiatrist. She was seen by a uh, psychologist. Um, following on, so that was known as the X case decision that allowed for abortion on the basis of suicide risk. <clears throat> In fact, the woman didn't go for an abortion because she subsequently miscarried. Um, um, there were a few other cases then subsequently. There was a Miss C case where um, she where, where um, she was suicidal and was taken to England for an abortion and then subsequently regretted it and has written and spoken a lot about that since. Um, there were several referenda to try and overturn the decision of the Supreme Court based on the suicide risk to take that out of the equation. But, um, but, but, the, but the referendum was defeated. That was in 2002. And the reason it was defeated, because some of the pro-choice, some of the pro-life um, people were, were voted um, um, voted against the proposal to take the um, suicide risk out, not because they didn't want it out, but because they felt it wasn't going far enough. Um, and so, so the, some of the smaller pro-choice, pro-life groups joined with the pro-choice groups and defeated it. And it was defeated by something like half a percentage, very small defeat. But in any event, the status quo was maintained that um, suicide risk continued to be a grounds for abortion. And then uh, all was quiet, um, or relatively quiet, until 2012. In 2012, the Savita Hanapanavar case erupted. And the Savita Hanapanavar case, um, this, this was a young dentist, she was Indian, she was married, she was pregnant with her first baby, I think she was about four or five months pregnant, she was brought into hospital because of feeling unwell. She developed a temperature in hospital. Um, she, uh, her, 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 she, her husband said, she's not, she was clear she wasn't getting any better. And they said, can we have an abortion? Um, the obstetrician felt an abortion wasn't necessary, um, that the, the pregnancy didn't need to be terminated. What subsequently emerged is that the woman had sepsis and the sepsis was missed. So she wasn't appropriately treated with, with intravenous antibiotics until her seventh day in hospital, at which point she was experiencing organ failure and she subsequently died. So this was not due to the Eighth Amendment, to, or as it's called, Article 43.3. It was due to medical mismanagement, or the incorrect, she was not properly diagnosed. But nevertheless, when that case um, broke, it gave the pro-choice lobby the excused campaign for repeal of the Eighth. They constantly said this was because of the Eighth Amendment and she would have had an abortion if it hadn't been for the Eighth Amendment. The decision not to ab abort the baby or to terminate the pregnancy was not because of the Eighth, but because it was felt it was clinically not necessary at the time. Um, she had actually died six months earlier, but for some reason it didn't, um, the, the, the case didn't make headlines until um, around April uh, uh, 2012. <coughs> and since then, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the the pro-choice movement have um, have been leading the calls, as you can imagine, for legalised abortion. In 2012, the government said they would, the then government, which is the Fine Gael government, same as in power now, said they would legislate 
to give effect to the X case, which was legislate for abortion on the grounds of suicide risk. Um, and they, uh, they did so in 2013. Um, I was one of the people who spoke, they, they set up um, uh, hearings, I spoke at the hearings. In fact, even the pro-choice people admitted that abortion isn't a treatment for suicidality, but it was completely ignored and the law was passed. In the lead up to the passing of the law, um, I was actively involved with my own profession and my own profession were very laudable in this regard. Um, we, we notified, we contacted, all, a group of us contacted all the psychiatrists in the country, all the consultant psychiatrists in the country. There were, there were about 300, over 300 of them. Um, we got a, a, to, a total response rate of about 150, so about half of them responded. And of that, 120 said they would not participate in making decisions about abortion. This was not psychiatrist business, um, and there is no evidence base that abortion prevents suicide. So um, five people said they would participate and the remainder um, either didn't respond or um, said they didn't have an opinion. Uh, we had held press conferences about it, we did radio interviews and TV interviews, but the government still went ahead and legislated anyway. Um, even at that point, um, the pro-choice people and the pro-choice psychiatrists were saying this will not work because psychiatrists won't become involved in it. And sure, sure, they didn't become involved. Since the law was passed in 2013, there have been, I think, three or four abortions on the grounds of suicide risk. Um, so very few have taken place. But meanwhile, um, the pro-choice lobby have said we have to have, um, initially they said abortion um, on the grounds of um, so-called fatal fetal anomaly because there, were, there was a case taken to the European Court of Justice that um, said um, that women with fatal fetal anomaly um, were being subject to cruel treatment by not allowing them to have abortions in Ireland. So the campaign for that began. And then um, the government set up what's called the Citizens' Assembly, which was a group of 100 people selected um, from the population to discuss the issue. They heard witnesses. There were um, 30 witnesses, sorry, 28 witnesses called in total. 24 of them were from the pro-choice group. Four of us were from the pro-life side. Um, I was one of the people asked to give evidence. I initially said I would, and then I declined because I felt that I was colluding in what was a sham and a setup. We now know it was a setup because the day after I was to give my evidence, the committee, without having heard all the witnesses, said they were going to be uh, calling for repeal of the Eighth Amendment. Um, and uh, so they, they, they had reached their decision without he hearing all of the, the evidence. And, um, and subsequently, we discovered that some of the people on the committee who gave, or sorry, on the um, Citizens' Assembly were pro choice activists. Um, nevertheless, the government still uh, persisted and decides they formed a committee um, in the Dáil to hear further evidence. Again, it was filled with pro-choice activists and they decided that abortion should be allowed um, up to 12 weeks on demand. Um, because the rationale was because you can't prove rape so as to deal with people who have been raped or the subject of incest because you can't prove rape, it takes a long time to prove that rape and incest have taken place. They should allow for abortion on demand up to 12 weeks. Um, and um, that is what is now going ahead. Okay, so it, under the legislation that's proposed, <clears throat> um, what they're proposing to do is to put a question to the people um, at the end of May. The date that's proposed is the 28th of May, which, irony of ironies, is the International Day for Missing Children. Um, but that's the date they're proposing for the referendum. And they, the question will be put to them, um, do you support repeal of the Eighth Amendment to include a wording to the effect that um, the government will be able to legislate for abortion? Um, that is the, so they're going to remove the current wording and put in this wording giving the government permission to legislate. That's it. Um, they have said that if the people agree to that, that um, they will be introducing um, um, abortion uh, up to, on demand up to 12 weeks with, with, without, without, without having to see a GP. Anybody can, can, can request an abortion and be given it up to, 20, up to 12 weeks. 
They um, are allowing then for uh, abortion on the grounds of physical or mental health considerations um, at any point without gestational limits. Um, they uh, will require two doctors, one of whom specialises in the area in which the medical or psychiatric problem is, so they'll have a psychiatrist, maybe um, a respiratory physician, a cardiologist, plus another doctor um, making that decision. It's not clear yet whether the person will have to be seen by the doctor or not. In Britain, they don't have to be seen by the doctors who sign the forms. In Ireland, it's not clear if the same will apply. There, there may be a three-day wait period um, that's proposed at the moment, but we're not sure about that. The government is saying that um, the GP, it will be a GP-led service because most of the abortions will take place before the 12th week and it will involve the abortion pill. Now, um, a, an opinion poll during the week found that 70% of GPs were not going to be involved in it, do not want to be involved in this. Um, in most countries, the abortion pill is not used beyond nine or ten weeks. Um, um, you also have to have ultrasound to confirm just the gestational age, uh, and most GPs don't have um, 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 uh, um, such facilities in their surgeries. So how that will work out remains to be seen. The legislation doesn't mention rape or incest because they say it can't be proven and they say that is why they've gone for the, the 12 week um, on demand um, um, proposal. Um, you will see from that legislation that this is far, far more liberal than your law here in, in Britain. Um, opinion polls have constantly shown that the Irish do not want a British style abortion law. They have said that time and time again. The most the Irish have been saying they want would be um, so-called fatal fetal anomaly, rape and incest, and even though that had been diminishing um, recently. So we have to wait and see. There's a lot of concern um, about the 12 week limit and the opinion polls show that um, if they persist with the 12 week limit that may well be lost, which I hope, they, I wish they'd go for 18 weeks in fact, so that it would be lost more powerfully. But anyway, um, if, they go, if they go for 12 weeks that the public will vote against it and vote to retain Article 43.3, which is of course what, what I want to see and we all want to see. But that's the proposal as it is at the, at the moment. Now, um, to, at the moment, by the way, um, the number of women seeking abortion in Britain has diminished significantly. It was at its peak in the 1990s when it went over 5,000 per year. It's now down to about 3,200. It's been diminishing year on year, and it predates the abortion pill the reduction. And uh, the pro-choice movement were saying, well, people are going to Holland because, you know, abortion is cheap in Holland and the airfares are cheap. And it's been looked into in Holland, and we've got data from Holland, and the numbers going to Holland are very few, a few dozen a year if most. So it would seem to be a real reduction in the number of people coming to the UK um, for abortion at a time when Ireland is planning on introducing a, an extremely liberal law. Now, the relevant questions then in relation to um, abortion, and I'm happy to make the slides available to anybody who, who wants them, um, and you can, you can ask the organisers because they have a copy of them. The question is, is, is does abortion um, harm women's um, health? Um, and a lot of the uh, pro-life campaign has been on the harm that abortion does to women's health. I think that's only a very small part of the argument. Um, and in some respects, it's almost, um, I won't go so far as to say it's a non-argument, because you could say most procedures have side effects, potential side effects, and so too abortion may have. The question is how severe are they? It's, it's a relevant question. I will talk about it, but Priscilla will speak in more detail about it. I think there are some people in the pro-life movement who say that abortion has huge effects for, for very many women. The data does not bear that out. It, bears, it, it shows that there are some effects for some women, not there are huge effects for most women. So I think we have to be careful about how we use that argument because um, when you look at the data closely, um, and, and I will dis discuss it with you, there's evidence of some harm for some women. Um, a more relevant question um, 
for you in Britain and for, for us here, and indeed for, for most, for many European countries where abortion is enacted to save the, to help the physical and mental health of women, is does abortion help women's mental health? And that's a question I'm going, does it prevent women developing mental health problems if they have, if they, if they have an unplanned or an unwanted <coughs> pregnancy? And the third question is, how does it affect um, relationships and there's a, a gathering body of evidence that it does affect relationships with partners and and spouses um, both at an emotional level and at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a physical sexual level as well I think Priscilla is going to discuss that also so a good a good place to start when you were <clears throat> when you're asking the question does abortion help or harm women's mental health are with um, with science <clears throat> and the textbooks of psychiatry um, is a good starting point. What do the textbooks say? Do they point to psychiatric indications for abortion? Do they point to the harm that abortion may do? Um, and if so, what do they say about them? The second approach <clears throat> is to look at the scientific papers. What do the scientific papers say? <clears throat> and of course, as with most scientific papers, depending on your methods, your, your whole pile of issues, not to mention sometimes the political affiliations um, and the ideological affiliations of the writers, you find various results. And so when you get different papers with different results, um, some finding harm, some finding no harm, um, how would you synthesize it all? And the highest level of evidence is to try and where possible combine the papers together um, you, you select the papers with the highest quality, uh, meeting, uh, meeting certain criteria for, for, for the, the methodology that's been used, and you combine them. And you try and pool the data insofar as you can. And that's the question I was asking David about earlier, about pooling data, where there is you know, some papers showing a 1% increase in suicide, others showing a 5% increase. Can you pool them? And if, if, the paper, if there aren't enough papers, or if their quality isn't good enough, you can't. But, 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 but you can, and I'll be talking about some of those studies in relation to mental health and mental illness and abortion in a moment. So that's the highest level of, of evidence in, in um, medicine at the moment, or systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Meta a systematic review is the written part, the meta-analysis is the, is the, if you can pool the data statistically and, and get, get, crunch the numbers, that's the meta-analysis. So there, that's the highest level of evidence. Now, let's come back to the textbooks. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of textbooks now, and I can't see them at this remove because the print is small, and I don't, I don't have. Let me just look out and look in here for myself. Okay. Okay. The first, the first book is a perinatal psychiatry book called Modern Management of um, Perinatal Psychiatric Disorders. Um, and it's published by the Royal College of Psychiatrists' own publishing house. Um, and um, it's, you can see what it says there. Most women will not be at... Most women will not be at risk of mental health problems post-abortion, but it does identify a number of risk factors. Now, the thing about the risk factors, even the pro-choice people reluctantly agree on one or two risk factors, but they don't like talking about risk factors, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it doesn't mention any psychiatric indications for psychiatry, for, for abortion. So this textbook, published by the Royal College Publishing House by very well-known perinatal psychiatrists, doesn't identify any psychiatric indications for abortion. Um, there's another one, um, Seminars in Liaison Psychiatry. And Liaison Psychiatry is the branch of psychiatry that deals with general medicine, including um, obstetrics. And um, the chapter on perinatal psychiatry um, says that women who, sorry, some of that has disappeared, women who request termination of pregnancy and those referred to child protection, um, they say that they need close follow-up. That's essentially what they say. Some of it has gone missing there for some reason. Okay, um, let's look at two more textbooks. Handbook of Liaison Psychiatry 
and the seminars in general adult psychiatry, both of which have chapters on perinatal psychiatry, which is where you would expect the abortion issue to be dealt with. And neither mentions abortion either in relation to harm or to indications. And this is the biggest textbook of psychiatry in the world. Um, Sadoc and Sadoc, so over to two volumes, 4,000 pages. I would not have met the Ryan Ayer weight criteria coming over last night if I had that book in my thing. The, 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 um, the index alone is 135 pages, and it's not a small book. It's a big, it's the same as a telephone directory. It's that size, so it's A3 uh, size. Um, it's a huge book. And it says there are no adverse psychological effects, but there are no, but it said there, but it doesn't mention any psychiatric indications for, um, for um, abortion. So here are these um, <clears throat> textbooks saying that there's no evidence of psychological problem, but not, none of them mention any psychiatric indications. Now, one of the strange things about that is that mental health prevention or mental health grounds for abortion are mentioned in the legislation in the UK. If our legislation in Ireland um, go, go, comes through, um, they, they will not be distinguishing between mental and physical health, so it will be allowed. Uh, Spain and France all allow for the mental health criteria, New Zealand and Australia. Um, so, so it's mentioned in many, many <coughs> countries on the assumption that abortion does actually um, prevent mental health problems. Now, there are very few studies that have examined this question, but a reasonable starting point is to say, okay, if there are mental health grounds for abortion, and, and in, 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 the, in, in um, New Zealand and in Britain, I don't have the data from other countries, but in those two countries, um, the mental health grounds are the most common grounds on which abortion is sought. Uh, something like 95.5% of abortions are done on the health ground, and of those, 98.8 or 0.5 are done on the mental health ground. So, if this, these are overwhelmingly um, causing the huge numbers, um, if, if, if this is the reason for the huge numbers seeking abortion in this country, and as you know, there are about 100 and, 180, 190,000 a year. Um, if, if these are the grounds, um, you would expect there to be some adverse consequences if they couldn't get abortion. Okay? Does anybody disagree that that's a reasonable starting point? These are mental health grounds. If you can't get it, there must be significant consequences. And it really hasn't been studied until recently. And there's a study <coughs> that you should know about. There we are. Published in December 2016, um, it's a study of refused abortion called the Turn Away Study. And it's called the Turn Away Study because these people were turned away from um, the abortion services that, um, where, they, where they saw the abortions. And this study took place in the US. People are not turned away in, um, in Britain at all. People are not refused abortion. But in the states, different states have different gestational periods beyond which um, abortion is not allowed. They're usually pretty high, 20, 24 weeks, 28 weeks, and some states don't have any gestational limits. I had a patient who um, was actually, I, I, she, was, she, was, she was refused an abortion in the UK because she was uh, at 26 weeks gestation. She couldn't make up her mind. She would go to a clinic, then change her mind, go and would change her mind. So she eventually went to New York and had an abortion at 28 weeks gestation in New York. She developed huge problems afterwards, as you can imagine, and she became actively suicidal. And it's one of the occasions when I've had to breach confidentiality. If somebody's risk is at, life is at risk um, in medicine, and, and they don't want you to disclose it to anybody, and they don't want you to tell their family, you can, um, in order to save their lives, break, breach confidentiality. So I eventually, um, she wouldn't let me tell her She'd broken up with her partner, wouldn't let me tell her parents, uh, wouldn't let me tell her siblings or her friends. And in the end, I, and I was seeing her every day, and she would not come into hospital. Um, and in order to get her into hospital, I would have had to involve a relative in certifying her. And 
uh, eventually I persuaded her after about two weeks of seeing her every day, including weekends, um, saying to her, look, I really, either you tell your parents or I tell your parents, but I'm going to have to at this stage because she was very, very suicidal. And eventually she told them um, and they were obviously um, devastated, but, <coughs> but she, got, she, got, she got through it and didn't, didn't end her life and she's now um, opposed to um, a, a abortion. But she had an abortion at 28, 26, 28 weeks in New York. The point about this is that the, the, the gestation limits are very high in the US following Roe versus Wade. Um, <clears throat> although that's changing in state by state now. And I think it was it Missouri or somewhere passed a law yesterday or the day before banning abortions after 18 weeks. Um, <coughs> anyway, this study, it's an American study and it was done at the University of California, which is a very active um, research program on abortion, but all on the pro-choice side. Um, and um, they recruited um, from over a two year period at 30 abortion facilities throughout the US. And they interviewed the people by telephone one week after the procedure and then every four months, sorry, every six months thereafter for um, five years. And they measured just a few things. They measured depression, anxiety, self-esteem and life satisfaction. Now, one of the problems is that for the depression and anxiety questions, they only ask two questions. So how you can diagnose clinical depression with two questions, or clinical depression with clinical anxiety with two questions, is beyond me, and I think it's, um, it's, it's just expanding sadness and unhappiness and general stress and, and medicalizing them, um, and in fact, in, in this paper, at the end, they say these people may not have had clinical depression, but that's not the impression that you get when you read the abstract or the title. Anyway, these the, these were the measures they used, and they invited over 3,000 women to participate, <clears throat> um, of whom slightly more than a third agreed. And of those who agreed, by the time they came to be interviewed a few days later, there was an attrition rate of over 100, so, uh, so nine, uh, yeah, so, sorry, of under 100, just about, about 80, 84, 86, uh, interviewed. Um, so there was a further attrition there. And they were interviewed by telephone. And then followed up for five years, and by the follow-up period after five years, every six months after five years, the number who were still available and willing to be interviewed was down to, 558. So in terms of the numbers who were initially recruited, it represents 17% of, sorry, in terms of the number invited, it was 17% of the number invited were finally interviewed and um, the, that, that um, 558 were 42% of those who were, inter who, had, who, who were actually agreed to be interviewed at the beginning. So there's a huge question about the representativeness of this sample. <clears throat> Is this representative, there's been a huge attrition rate, and when people drop out of studies, it's usually because they just want you to go, to go away, and it, 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 usually they, have, they, 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 they are thought to have mental health problems. They've had a recurrence of the mental health problem and are not willing to participate anymore. So, so that's a huge problem with this study. And the, co the comparison groups are interesting. <clears throat> they found that, but they studied three comparison groups, three groups. There was a baseline group, which I'm calling the comparison group. And these were a group of people who were near the gestational limits. Um, there were there was 452 of them. They they were they were under the gestational limits, so they were able to have legal late term abortions. And they compared them with a group um, who had first trimester abortions, a smaller group of 273. And then there was a group who were refused the abortion. <coughs> they were the turn away group, 230 of those. And those that third group were divided into two. Um, some of those went on um, to have abortions in other states, about 70 of them, um, about a third of them. But the remainder either gave birth or had miscarriages. So of the women turned away, most of them didn't actually go on to seek an abortion elsewhere. 
they actually gave birth. Um, a few of them had miscarriages. So almost two thirds of the, those who refused the abortion gave, gave birth without going elsewhere. But the smaller group of 70 did. Now, they're interesting. Um, now, the paper, the paper pulls its punches because like all pro-choice uh, um, works and mouthpieces, they don't delve or don't emphasize um, certain things in the paper. What they say is that um, one week after having an abortion, compared with the last, the, compared with the late abortion group, that's the second group, those denied an abortion reported more anxiety symptoms, lower self-esteem, but similar levels of depression. Now, that might be counterintuitive that they have similar, similar levels of depression, but anyway, that's what they found. Um, they had more anxiety symptoms and lower self-esteem. Well, heck, that's, that's, that's what you expect. If people want something and they're deprived of it, they're going to get a bit anxious and a bit tense and a bit stressed about it. It doesn't mean they have a disorder as, as a psychiatrist or as, even as a GP would, would understand it. And, and they found that anxiety um, was significantly higher um, in the, those denied <coughs> the abortion uh, who didn't give birth, in other words, those who were denied abortion but then went on to have it elsewhere, or else had miscarriages. Anxiety was significantly higher than, 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 than the, the other groups, than the group who actually had gave birth. Um, so again, that's showing the opposite of what you would read in the abstract of the paper, which says that the turnaway group uh, as a whole had more anxiety symptoms. When you actually look at table four in the paper, and look at the group that had the highest level of anxiety symptoms. It was the group that were turned away, but then went on to have abortion elsewhere. The group who actually gave birth um, did not have higher anxiety symptoms. Um, so what this paper is showing is that yes, being turned away and being refused an abortion is associated with higher, um, with higher levels of anxiety symptoms and lower self-esteem but it's in one specific turnaway group. It doesn't generalize, it's not the, the total group. And what they also found then, when they followed that group up, the, the, the group that went on to have the abortions and that didn't give birth, that their symptoms had resolved pretty, pretty quickly, so any negative effect was not sustained. So to claim that this shows that um, if, you, if you refused abortion, you would develop mental health problems is actually, it's actually a very weak, it's actually a very weak paper. It was published in um, a highly prestigious psychiatric journal, JAMA, um, JAMA Psychiatry. It was previously called the Archives of General Psychiatry, and it was a psychiatric journal with the highest impact factor. So I just don't know how it got published, but one has one's um, suspicions. <clears throat> so the bottom line in this is study, and this is the only study that has ever examined people who refused an abortion is that those who refused abortion, who later obtained an abortion, are miscarried, showed anxiety and low level symptoms in the early weeks. The symptoms improved over time and there were no long term mental health consequences. And most of those refused, uh, almost two thirds gave birth. So that's the bottom line from being refused abortion. Now, um, I, I move on now to briefly discuss the relationship between um, abortion and mental health problems. Does abortion cause mental health problems? And there are um, three questions, three approaches to this. One is that um, abortion itself causes mental health problems. If you control for everything else, but two women who are otherwise very similar, juxtaposition them, one has an abortion um, um, for an unwanted stroke, unplanned pregnancy, the other doesn't. <coughs> what will happen? Um, and um, some pro-life people say abortion causes mental health problems. The woman who has the abortion will have mental health problems. The woman who doesn't won't. Second, approach, is, second view is that mental health problems are due to having an unwanted pregnancy. So it's not 
the um, abortion per se, it's having an unwanted pregnancy that's the problem. And if you don't deal with the unwanted pregnancy, that woman will go on to having, having mental health problems. That question, I think, is answered in, in the approach that, that we, we took in the previous slides of looking at people that are, who are clearly have an unwanted pregnancy, but are refused the abortion. What happens then? But the third, and, and the most interesting one, is that abortion and mental health problems are due to some third factor that causes the mental health problems that's lurking in the background. Might be partner violence, might be poor social supports, it might be a prior history of mental health problems. And, and I think that this is very interesting because for me as a clinician, I have seen many women who have had mental health problems post-abortion. But women come in all shapes and sizes with all kinds of histories. And, and in a clinical situation, you can't think of the woman without, without thinking of all aspects of her life. So if a woman has had an abortion and had prior mental health problems, and because she had the risk factor for prior mental health problems, has now had developed a depressive episode or an anxiety stage or has self-harmed, I can't say that isn't due to the abortion. When she herself has a prior mental health history and has the abortion, and after the abortion, shortly afterwards, develops these symptoms, I have to say the abortion has some role in that, and I can't ignore it in my treatment of her. The pro-choice people will say the, abor the abortion is totally irrelevant, and it's really all to do with the mental health problems. But most people who develop mental health problems have risk factors. So we can't, as psychiatrists, without, uh, without sacrificing holism, ignore that. So I think that when women develop mental health problems, they do have risk factors in the background. They have poor social supports. They're sometimes coerced. They're sometimes, they're some, they, they, they sometimes feel they have no other choice because they won't be able to get on with their studies. I, have one, I know of one person, um, she, uh, her mother became a patient of mine. She was a student. She became pregnant. Her, her parents were paying for her uh, studies um, in Dublin. Her parents said, if you, unless you have an abortion, we are not paying for your studies and you'll have to move out of home. So she went and had an abortion. She herself actually coped okay with the abortion, but her mother didn't and her mother became a patient of mine. And her mother deeply, deeply regretted what she had said to her daughter and the fact that her daughter, I mean, she coped okay with the abortion. Her daughter was upset after the abortion and regretted, but didn't develop a mental health problem. But her mother, her mother did. And she was, it was quite a difficult to treat depressive illness, and we had to do, as well as giving her medication, get, get her to write letters to the baby, to give the baby a name, write letters to God and stuff like that. And she was quite a religious woman as well, which added to her, her difficulties um, um, dealing with her guilt. Um, so, so women have abortions for all kinds of reasons, and you can't separate that, that out from the act of actually being in the doctor's chair or taking the abortion pill. Um, it's all a part, part of the whole person and how they react. So when pro-choice people object to talking about risk factors and they don't like us talking about risk factors because they say they're irrelevant, they don't like it when we say they're very irrelevant and we have to take them into account when we see patients who after an abortion come to us with mental health problems. And these are the risk factors that have been um, identified. Those with prior history of mental health problems is a big one. So those with, with prior mental health problems <coughs> might come to a doctor and do come to doctors saying, I've had past history of depression or postnatal depression, I'm pregnant, will it come back again? And the doctor will say, yes, it might be a good idea if you had an abortion um, in order to avoid uh, in order to avoid mental th that happening in the future. I, have, I know somebody. Um, who uh, had, had a severe depressive illness um, and required ECT as a young woman. She got married and became pregnant, and her depression recurred during the pregnancy, and the psychiatrist advised her to have an abortion. She refused. Um, and not only that, but she didn't have postnatal depression, and she hasn't had depression since then, so, because, and she's on ongoing uh, prophylactic treatment. So the proper management, um, you know, and she, she herself, as I say, who wasn't particularly pro-choice or pro-life, but just, just wanted the baby and was willing to take her chances, um, 
did, did, did very well. But doctors do advise people to terminate pregnancies if they have a past history of depression. Those who are young, um, 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 people, teenagers having abortion often develop major mental health problems afterwards. I wasn't aware of that myself, um, and I was asked about it in my, when I was taking my, my membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists exam. I was asked about it, and um, I was working in Nottingham at the time, actually, although I think David wasn't there at the time, um, I was a bit before his time, and I was asked about it in my Viva. What, you know, is, does abortion harm women? And I said, I don't know. And the psychiatrist, the child psychiatrist said, yes, young women are harmed by, by abortion. I was amazed, and I sort of followed it up afterwards. And women who are ambivalent about an abortion, people who have late abortions, um, and those who had a so-called fatal fetal anomaly have <coughs> major mental health problems afterwards. Um, those with maternal instincts, as you might anticipate, are who have previous children, those with poor social supports and moral objections, and those who have multiple abortions also. I've been told to hurry up, so I will. <laughs> so, um, let's ask the question then, does abortion harm women's mental health? And some studies have shown some harm, and some have shown no harm. And this has been studied in a meta-analysis published by the um, Academy of Royal Colleges, led by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So all the Royal Colleges, <coughs> headed by the psychiatrists, as you can imagine, because it's a psychiatric topic, published um, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2011. Um, and then um, that was reanalyzed two years later, um, plus another meta-analysis included in it by a man called David Ferguson, whom I'll talk about in just a moment. So what did the Royal Colleges sh find, and what did they do? They found that when a woman has an unwanted pregnancy, the rates of mental health would be largely unaffected whether she has an abortion or goes on to give birth. So again, no evidence of benefit in this meta-analysis combining the studies, um, and no evidence of harm. And this was based, they, they studied hundreds, they took hundreds of studies and read over 300 studies, and they found the four met the criteria, the standards of control for confounders, that, that, all, that control for prior mental health and wantedness. Because if you study women having abortion who were wanted pregnancy, the effects would obviously be anticipated to be very different. They would definitely have mental health problems, like people who have, who have abortion, uh, abortions when, when babies have, have um, birth defects, for example. So they, they took the, four, the <coughs> only four studies in the literature that controlled for prior mental health and wantedness, and these were the, um, the studies. And um, based on that, they found that there was no effect, no adverse effect, and no, uh, no benefit either. It didn't prevent, uh, it didn't make any difference to the outcome when women went on and gave birth to follow an unwanted pregnancy. Now, um, David Ferguson then did um, a very interesting thing. He took, he has done a number of studies and stuff, and he's a very interesting man. He's a psychologist in um, New Zealand. Have you heard of David Ferguson? Some of you. Psychologist from New Zealand. He's probably one of the most prolific psychologists um, in, the, in, 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 the, in his field. He uh, has done a big study in Christchurch where he followed up um, children from birth to the age of 30. He is an atheist, he is pro-choice, and he has published two or three studies on abortion, which suggested that for some women, abortion is associated with mental health problems. And his, even when you control the confounders, and Ferguson 2008 is one of the studies that was included in the, um, in the systematic review by, by him. He controlled for all of the confounders, including prior mental health and wantedness. And so what he did was he took those four studies that the Medical Royal Colleges worked on, and he added some others that he felt met the criteria, including the systematic review meta-analysis that Professor Coleman did, and we should be talking um, to you about that. Incidentally, she found much higher rates for mental health problems in her study than did Ferguson in, in this study, where he reanalyzed the, um, all of that data, and so there has been controversy around that. But um, he, he took her study and the other four, and it was published in 2013 in the Australia and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. And he um, found um, that 
Um, he examined the uh, effects of abortion on anxiety, depression, alcohol misuse, illicit drug misuse, and suicidal behavior. And he used what are called pooled odds ratios and calculated random effects model. And he found that <clears throat> there was consistent evidence to show that abortion was not associated with a reduction in the rates of mental health problems. Again, confirming the Turnaway study and the Royal College. No evidence of benefit, but it was associated with a small to moderate increase in the risks of alcohol misuse, substance misuse, anxiety, and suicidal behavior. And he said there is no available evidence to suggest that abortion has therapeutic effects in reducing the mental health risks of unwanted or unintended pregnancies. There is suggestive evidence that abortion may be associated with a small to moderate increase in the risks of some mental health problems, and there are direct quotes from his paper. Um, in an earlier paper, he said in a journal, which I edited at that point, in practice, in the region of 94% of abortions in the UK are justified on the grounds that continuance of the pregnancy would pose a risk to the mental health of the mother. However, to provide such justification requires strong evidence showing that mental health risks of unwanted childbirth outweigh the mental health risks of abortion. Although decisions on whether to proceed with induced abortion are made on the basis of clinical assessments of the extent to which abortion poses a risk to maternal mental health, these clinical assessments are not currently supported by population evidence showing that the provision of abortion reduces mental health risks of, for women having unwanted pregnancy. So he's saying it's based on the clinical decisions rather than any evidence from population-based studies. We, of course, know that it's not based on clinical decisions because these women are not seen clinically. Um, finally, Gisler and suicide. Um, the Scandinavians have all kinds of registers, and they have registers of induced abortions and cause of death registers. And this is um, a Finnish study. They merged the two, so you're able to find out of the people who had abortions, who died by suicide. And they found that the rate of suicide after abortion declined between 1987 and 2012, after the Finnish government had introduced closer monitoring of women for mental health problems post-abortion. And they found, he found in his study that abortion, that the rate of, abort, of suicide among women was still higher um, among women having um, <coughs> abortions than in those not having abortions, and that it was increased particularly among teenagers. That goes back to my viva in Nottingham when I was doing my membership and the question I was asked. So, these are the most common mental health problems, as we've said already. Depression doesn't appear to be in there, and that's counterintuitive. You would expect it to be, but it is not found, at least in the studies that have been conducted. Conclusion. Psychiatric textbooks do not uh, indicate any psychiatric indications for abortion. There's no evidence of benefit to mental health that it reduces risk. There's some evidence of harm, and the highest risk is for substance misuse and suicidal behavior, and I should have anxiety disorders in there as well. Refused abortion is associated with higher levels of anxiety in the turnaway, no birth group, in other words, the turnaway group who had abortions, and adverse effects of, abor of refused abortion in that group, however, are shocking. Thank you for your patience, and I'm sorry I've run over time.